Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the post Ken Norton Jr. era in Seattle. We've been here for about 17, 18 hours at, uh, as of the time of this upload. And yesterday I made a video right after we got the announcement. And now that we've had a night and a morning and part of an afternoon to digest it, and really think about what it could mean and where this team can go from here. I want to talk about a few things. So, the the first video was mostly just talking about the fact that it had happened and what it directly meant, but I, I want to go over a few more things now that we've had some time and we've had the opportunity to see what's coming out of the organization following this move. So, first I want to talk about Ken Norton Jr. I want to talk about the part that is departing. And a lot of people in the stream we did last night, a few people on my video that I posted last night are saying he's a scapegoat. Pete Carroll found himself a scapegoat and pinned it all on him and got to escape any accountability for his own failures because he was able to pin it on Ken Norton Jr. And don't get me wrong, that, that is true. I, I agree with that sentiment, at least in a general sense. But at the end of the day, here's what I'm going to say about it. Ken Norton Jr., his defenses were not that good. Over his time in Seattle, he had two above-average defenses. He had one bad defense and one average defense. On the whole, uh, the, like like in 2020, the defense started out one of the worst in NFL history, and then it played really good down the stretch, so it came out to about average at the end of the year. But at the end of the day, it's not like that unit was really doing their job. So you can't go that wrong with moving on from Ken Norton Jr. But even within the whole scapegoat argument where people are right, Ken Norton Jr. is the fall guy for Carroll. He's the pinata for Carroll. He's the guy that he got to point to when he went into that meeting with Jody Allen and say, hey, it, it's not it's not my fault. I'll, I'll, it's his fault. I'll get him out of here and things are going to get better. But I do find it kind of interesting that it happened that way, where the Seahawks went a week after the season ended, where it looked like nothing really was going to change. And then we know that Pete and Jody had that meeting at the end of the season. I think it was Thursday or Friday. And then this happens. So, while we'll never know for sure, it doesn't seem like Pete Carroll was the driving force behind getting Norton out of here. It seems like it might have had something to do with Jody Allen and what may have been said in that meeting. Now, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. On the one hand, it means that Pete Carroll was forced to face some degree of scrutiny for the failures of the 2021 season. On the other hand, you don't want an owner to be butting in to the extent where she actually dictates who gets to stay and who gets to go. So I, I can see that going either way, but I'm going to take that as a little bit of a positive because it, it meant that Carol at least had to face some scrutiny where he, he had to be questioned on uh, why did this season go so bad? Well, what's going on here? How did you mess this up? And he probably had to respond with something like, okay, I'm going to get rid of my defensive coordinator. It's his fault. At least he had to face that scrutiny. And look, the other part of this is, and, and this is definitely a good thing, Carroll is running out of scapegoats. Last year, we got rid of our offensive coordinator. Now we're getting rid of our defensive coordinator. So if things do not improve, if we do not go on a run and have a successful 2022 Carroll's going to be down to the nub in terms of guys he can scapegoat. It's going to be John Schneider and Russell Wilson. And I don't think anybody's going to fall for John Schneider because I think we all understand that Carroll's really the GM here. He has more personnel powers than Schneider. So I don't think that that's going to work. Now, depending on how 2022 goes, he might be able to scapegoat Russell Wilson. That's at least on the table. It depends on who performs in a 2022 season where maybe you don't meet your expectations overall, but maybe the offense is top five. Maybe Wilson's uh, elite quarterback again. Then Carroll doesn't really have the ability to scapegoat Russell Wilson. So he he's running out of people to hide behind, and that should be considered a good thing no matter what, because um, 
if this season doesn't go according to plan, I don't think there's going to be anywhere for him to run. And I don't think his long-term contract extension is going to save him. I think the only thing at this point that can save him is success. Unmitigated, objective success. So, unless we get hit with a massive flurry of injuries in 2022, I don't think Pete Carroll's going to be able to deflect anymore. And you can be upset at the fact that he was able to deflect this time, where it seems like he really did offer up Ken Norton Jr. as a pound of flesh to make people like Jody Allen happy, and to a certain extent make us fans happy, because something at least happened. He's kind of out of pounds of flesh to give. So... Take some solace in that. Yes, Pete's been running from his failures for a while now. He's been doing scapegoat stuff for a while now. There's a long list of guys who he's pushed out of Seattle to save his own behind, but he's running out, and I think that's good. All right, so that's really all I have to say about the Ken Norton Jr. side of this. Let's talk about where we go from here. So who's going to replace Ken Norton Jr. That's what a lot of people are thinking about right now. That's what a lot of people want to know right now. So as of this moment, there are two primary candidates. One I've already spoken about. It's uh, Clint Hurt. And I want to say this. I'm not saying anything negative about Clint Hurt, okay? I, I'm not. His resume, it's it's it makes sense that he would probably be looking to take a step up to the defensive coordinator role in the upcoming future, which is why, by the way, he might, he he was thinking about going back to the Miami Hurricanes to be their defensive coordinator. Uh, if you take a look at his resume, he's been a defensive line coach in college. He was a defensive line coach in college for almost a decade. Uh, he was a positional coach for the Bears for three years. Uh, I looked it up. The Bears over these three years did not have a particularly good defense for whatever that's worth. And then he's been a defensive line coach for the last five years in Seattle. Also been the assistant head coach. I don't know what that means, but... uh, Well, I mean, I know what it means literally. I don't know what it means in terms of what actual role he had and what power he may have had over just a defensive line coach. But this is a resume that matches up with somebody who would be looking to get their first shot as a defensive coordinator. So that part's fine. My, my thing is just, he's another guy who will not challenge Pete Carroll in any way, who will just be a yes-man puppet for Carroll running that defense. You're not going to bring in anything too exotic. You're not going to bring in anything different. You're not going to be looking for Carroll to maybe delegate the responsibility of running the defense to the coordinator so he can focus on just being a head coach and a motivator maybe. You're not going to see any of that with the Clint Hurt. It's just going to be another guy who does what he's told and runs the same basic defensive concepts. You're, you're going to see little differences with the play calling probably. You, you might see a little differences with some of the wrinkles we throw in, but it, it's just not going to... It's not going to intrigue me until I actually see really good results on the field, is the point. So, nothing against Clint Hurt. He might end up being a really good defensive coordinator. It's just not something I'm going to get excited about until we get to the season in September and I see this defense playing really well under his um, coordinator work. So, now, me getting excited and us getting excited in the offseason is not a prerequisite for having actual success. But I do want to throw out one interesting name that has been floated with this job over the last 18 hours that would actually get me a little excited. Ed Donatel, formerly of the Denver Broncos under Vic Fangio, is apparently the other primary defensive coordinator candidate for the Seahawks. Most reports are that it's going to be either Clint Hurd or Ed Donatel. Ed Donatel, if we bring in somebody from the outside, is the lead candidate. So, let me say this. I love Brian Flores. Brian Flores, I think he's awesome. I would love to have him as my DC. I don't see it happening. I think he's going to get a head coaching gig. But even if he doesn't, Brian Flores would bring in a defense that is so antithetical and different from what Carroll does on defense it's hard for me to believe that would work. It's hard for me to believe that Carroll would completely hand the defense over to a Brian Flores. 
Brian Flores mostly runs 3-4. He does a lot of exotic blitz stuff. It, it The Carroll defense, I, I just don't see that coming together. I don't see him willing to make it come together either. Vic Fangio is a little different. His defense is not such a radical departure from Carroll's defense, I don't think, but it's still different. And Vic Fangio has such a long list of qualifications to be a defensive coordinator. Like, he's had so much success as a defensive coordinator that if you bring him in, he, he's not going to come in here to be anybody's punk. He's going to come in here and expect to have complete control of the defense. It's going to be his show. Nobody's looking over his shoulder. Nobody's grabbing the play sheet from him. Nobody's going to tell him what to do because he's Vic Fangio. And if the Seahawks won't give him complete power over a defense, he'll find a team that will. Ed Donatell might be like a compromise between just promoting someone in-house and getting somebody who's going to have all the power and um, all the control. Because Ed Donatell has done positive things as a defensive coach outside of just Pete Carroll's thumb. He's actually been a defensive coach in the league for decades now. But I don't see him as being somebody who would want to come in and completely overhaul the defense and do things completely his way either. Uh, Matty F. Brown was actually tweeting a little bit this morning about how Donatel would probably want to do some of the things that Norton was doing just to a more extreme degree in terms of how our our secondary played. So it would in many ways be an opportunity to kind of take some of the concepts that Norton was working with that were working fairly well and run with them a little bit. So Ed Donatel might be the compromise between people like me who want completely different things on defense and Carol who probably wants to do all the same stuff on defense. Uh, if you look at Donatell's coaching resume, it, it goes all the way back to the 1970s. Uh, granted, a lot of college stuff. Uh, he was a defensive back and secondary coach for the 90s. He won two Super Bowls in the uh, Denver, by the way. Uh, he started getting work as a defensive coordinator in 2000 with the Packers. Uh, if any of you guys are old enough to remember 4th and 26 with the Packers in the playoffs, that lost him his job. So we're not too excited about that. <clears throat> but um, he, he, he wasn't terrible in Green Bay. And then he went to Atlanta and coached, uh, coordinated three roughly average defenses. And then he got canned, went to New York for a year. And, okay, we got to put a pause right here because he was the defensive coordinator for the Washington Huskies the year they went 0-12. So that's going to resurface some bad memories for some people. But, hey, that was 12, well, now, excuse me. 14 years ago, so forgive and forget. I'm, I'm willing to move on from that. And for the most part since then, he's been around Vic Fangio. Uh, he spent two years as a Bronco secondary coach, defensive back coach for the Niners. Uh, he was with the Bears as a defensive back coach um, from 2015 to 2018, so Fangio was there with him. And then he became the defensive coordinator for the Broncos the last three seasons. So, here's the thing. The Broncos' defense over the last three years has been average, really bad, really good. Uh, this most recent year, they were third in the league in points allowed. However, Vic Fangio was their head coach. So, we can probably give more credit to Vic Fangio than we can to Ed Donatel for the Broncos being really good on defense in 2021. But this is a guy who has been pretty well connected to Vic Fangio for practically the last decade overall, right? He, he's been a defensive back coach under him, and he's been the defensive coordinator under him. So he's probably learned a lot of stuff under him, and he's had a decent amount of success under him. That Bears defense under, under Fangio and Donatel was mostly pretty successful. They had that one deep playoff, well, not a deep playoff run, but a 12-4 and four season. Um, despite having Mitchell Trubisky as their quarterback. And there's some stuff to like here. He's got a lot of experience. I think he would be able to bring in a new perspective, but not necessarily the accomplishments and the long track record of unmitigated success that would make him demand to be in control all the time. 
So Ed Donatel might be the guy to make everybody reasonably happy, if that if that makes sense. So let me know what you guys think down below. Right now, of those two guys, Donatel definitely interests me more, but we're probably going to be taking a look at more candidates in the near future. So see you guys later. Go Hawks. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think down below. Going to be kind of interesting. Hopefully it's interesting.